been talking about the foundations of worship, and I want to talk to you, and I'm going to try to do it quickly, but I want to give weight to the areas that really need to be focused upon. Uh, about breaking out of the box. Worship is always and has always broken out of the box. It just does. By nature of what it is, it does. It transcends boundaries. And I want to give you a definition of two different types of worship that we practice in our day and age. Because worship somehow got relegated to being an event, uh, which is not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. But if we come into a place like this and we worship Jesus with our lips and leave and we don't worship him with our lives, it's useless. It's absolutely useless. What is the point? It is a lifestyle that we engage in as worship. So by definition, worship has a bad thing. It's a great thing. Not taking away from it. One of the reasons that we come together to gather together as a congregation is that we are taking our individual worship and bringing it together collectively to honor and uplift our God. And so worship is a good thing. Worship has an event. The innermost parts of your being expressing love, admiration, and respect for God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. As an event, typically expressed in song or some type of physical movement, whether it be dancing, kneeling, lying, prostrating, whatever it may be, as an event of worship. Worship as a lifestyle. Very similar definition, but a different application. From the innermost parts of your being, expressing love, adoration, reverence, and respect for God, for choosing to live a life of obedience and surrender. Everyone say obedience. Everyone say surrender. Obedience and surrender to God and His will for your life rather than just doing whatever you want to do. Yep. Jesus says that we are to take up our cross, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. Somewhere along the way in our culture, we started to deviate from the understanding of denying ourselves and taking up our cross, and it became, well, you can express your freedom. Has anyone ever heard this? Yep. You, can, you can express your freedom in Christ to do whatever it is that you want to do. Well, listen, if your freedom causes somebody else to stumble, then it's not operating in love. Your freedom is defunct. Freedom is meant to operate under the umbrella of love, which means that if my freedom, because Paul says food sacrifice to idols, what's that? It's nothing. But if I eat food sacrifice to idols and it causes this little one to stumble, then I'm operating in the wrong way. I have freedom to do that. All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And so worship is a lifestyle of learning to deny yourselves, take up a cross, and follow Jesus. It's a lifestyle that we live. Here are some reasons for worship. Well, God's awesome. Number one, he's incredible. He's good. He doesn't just hold good as an aspect of who he is. The, 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 the makeup of his being is good. It's not that he just expresses good, he is good. It's not that he just expresses love, he is love. Wrap your, around, your mind around that. That's incredible. We express love, we hold love, he embodies love. People, that's great for That's awesome. That's so cool. Number two, to exalt, to promote, raise, or elevate God to his rightful place. It drives me nuts, and I know I've got no time, and I'm probably not going to get through very much of this, but it drives me nuts to think in this nation and other nations how much the name of Jesus and the name of our God is maligned across the whole world. Yep. And I don't find it any coincidence that they chose to use the name of God and associate it with damnation because they hate God. The Antichrist spirit hates God so much. But they put those two together for the sake of just trying to paint God out to be something that he's not. To pull down the name of Jesus. See, you will, man, you will see. There's a reason that I'll get up. And I don't have, man, I'm trying to give him the best of my God right now. My voice is gone. And I'm trying to do my best. But I will, man, until I am hoarse and I sound like an old lady that's smoked for forever, I will give all that I have to give to Jesus because his name deserves to be glorified. 
His name deserves to be exalted. His name deserves to be lifted on high. When other places and other nations and across this nation, His name gets teared down, not in this house. In this house, we'll lift His name up and give it His rightful due. At the end of the age, they're all going to bow with you whether they like it or not, so we might as well start now. Yep. Every knee will bow. Come on, nothing over here. Two, reasons for worship. Three, to rightly glorify, magnify, lift up the name of Jesus to his right place above all others. Number four, giving the world an example of what it is to know God. Yep. Giving the world an example of what it is to know God, but not just to know Him, to follow Him, to represent Jesus to the world. Why is obedience so important? Little eyes are watching you. Remember, be careful little eyes, what you see. Did you guys know this Be careful little eyes, what you see. For the We have a little rhythm issue. <laughs> but still, it's a great song. Be careful, little eyes. The life of watching them. Live Jesus to the world. Worship both types as an event, as a lifestyle, releases the authority of God into the world. If you don't think of authority as a big deal, Oh, I'm going to jump all over my notes and get ready for it. If you don't think authority is a big deal, when Jesus was tempted, Jesus is the second Adam. I'm going to give you a little bit of the next week's sermon before it comes. Jesus is the second Adam, right? The first Adam came, he failed. Sin, Adam and Eve, humanity, chose to bow their knee and fall in line to obey the voice of Satan over the voice of God. And they took of the fruit, they ate of the fruit, and as a result, Death and all that is bad came into the world. Increased pain in childbirth, having to work the ground because of, with weeds and all that stuff. Death came into the world as a result of that. A little bit of the nature of Satan entered into the world. His mission is to come to steal, kill, and destroy. When Adam and Eve bent their knee to Satan, what happened to the earth? Death came. Man lost it, therefore man had to win it back. But every man was marred with sin. We were born into sin. We had a bed inside of us that made it that we would choose to bend our knee and to sin when it presented itself to us. Not maybe all the time, but at some point we would, and one is all it takes. And so God looked down and said, I saw the plight of man and said, Man can't do this on his own. He can't do this. Word of God. I am sending you into the earth to take on flesh and appear as a man so that you could live the life that they failed to live and live perfect. That was what Jesus had to live a perfect life. Yeah, he had to live a perfect life because his knee had to be bent to God the Father constantly, never bent to the enemy. And what happened when you come up and you come across Luke chapter 4, it's also found in Matthew 4. Come across Luke chapter 4. You see, there's a temptation that happens in three, three being the number of completeness. Jesus is tempted three different ways by Satan at that time. But in, in Luke, I believe it's the second one that it happens. Uh, this is what he says. He says, uh, All this, actually, I might have that. Luke 5, 4, 5, 3. He said, And he led him up and showed him. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. This is Satan tempting Jesus. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me. Now, how did that happen? All dominion in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, dominion over the earth was handed over to Adam and Eve. They were to rule and impose their will, basically. Following the will of God over top of the, of the world. Everything was good. So this is a good thing. When the king is good, everything's good. And so it said, go, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over all that is in creation. Dominion 
was given to Adam and Eve to rule. Here's the problem. An invading kingdom came into their little nest called the Garden of Eden. God was setting up His kingdom on the earth, commissioned Adam and Eve to go out and spread His kingdom throughout the world, and Satan came in the form of a serpent, the second kingdom, into the garden in order to defeat man. And here's the thing, and here's the rule, and everyone knows this. When you have opposing kingdoms that come against each other, when one kingdom wins, that means the other one So Satan came in and tempted and said, God didn't tell you that you can't do this. Question the nature of God. This is the way God works. He said, God didn't tell you to do this. He just he's afraid that you're going to be better than him. What happens? What's the, what's the motivation of Satan? He wants to be like the... He's passing on his nature to them. He's baiting them to become like him, and they don't know it. And so what happens? They eat the apple, they fall, they realize that they're naked. Instantaneously, the man starts saying, It's the woman that you gave me! That never stopped. It's the woman that you gave me! She did it. But the woman turns and says, No, the serpent fooled me. It was always somebody else's fault, never theirs. Sin entered in the world. Man was defeated. And the dominion that he had passed hands. And it went from humanity into the hands of the enemy of God. He doesn't stand a chance against God. But the fact that man was made in his image is a real big slap in his face. And so this is why we see in Luke 4, 5, 8, Satan is saying, I will give you all this domain, for it has been handed over to me. When did it happen? Beginning of the age. Dominion was given to Satan through the failure of man. Therefore, Jesus had to come to live a perfect life. And listen to this. For it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me. The cost of gaining authority was to worship. The cost of being able to have a crossless victory, because that was really the temptation. The temptation was, you don't have to spill blood in order to get dominion over all of this. All you have to do is bow your knee to me and worship, and it's all yours. Why? Because worship releases authority. And Jesus rightly and brilliantly, because, well, let's just say he's Jesus, turns and says, get me behind me, say, worship the Lord your God, and him only will you serve. See, when Jesus went spreading his kingdom, his obedience to the Father was an act of worship. You know, now wait a minute, that's God worshiping God. Now that's a man who is 100% God giving us a prototype and an example of how to live the Christian life. Yep. And he walked it out in perfect obedience to be a sinless offering for you and me so that he can win back the authority that we forfeited through our sin. And that's why when we get to the end of the age, Jesus is res resurrected and he's going to the ascension. In Matthew 28, he turns to his disciples and he says, All has been given to... How did he get that authority? Obedience and surrender. Obedience and surrender releases authority. Obedience and surrender is a lifestyle of worship. Jesus exemplified this. He didn't just, he did it to win. And believe you me, he might have been stripped for a few moments naked in this natural world, but he rendered forever the powers of darkness and forces of the enemy naked for eternity by his victory. He did it so that you and I would be able to operate not according to the sinful nature, but according to the nature that was given to Adam in the beginning. That's called restoration. And we have been restored to do what? To worship. We have been restored. That's why it doesn't... Everyone has different methods of expressing worship and things like that. Some are excited. Some are not excited. Some are like hand raisers. Some are like pin them to the side of your head. You know what I mean? 
Like everyone's at different places as far as expressing your worship. You know what the greatest act of worship that you can give? Live, surrender, and obedience out there. And exemplify to the world who God is. Everywhere my feet tread, I take it for the kingdom of God. I am establishing authority wherever I go. I am releasing authority wherever I step. How is that possible? Because my life is a life of surrender and obedience. And as I surrender and obey God, where I step, His kingdom is established. For instance, Mark chapter 5. I'm way off my notes. Mark chapter 5. I'll do this quickly. I'll try to get back on, brother. I know I'm throwing you for a loop. Mark chapter 5, you get in there, and it's a demoniac in the region of the Gadarenes. He's, he's in the Decapolis. Decapolis just means ten cities. That's all it means. But you have a ten-city region in an area, and there is a man that is full of a legion of demons that is ruling over that area through fear and intimidation, establishing the kingdom of Satan. He, is, he has authority, so much authority, that he breaks chains and nothing that they do can bind him up anymore. And he rules over that area with intimidation and fear. And people will not mess with him out of fear of their own lives. And then this man named Jesus comes up to the shore. This is what I find fascinating. There were 13 men in that boat. There were 13 men in that boat that came up onto the shore. 12 disciples and Jesus this demoniac full of a legion of demons comes running runs up to the shore meets with one man and says what would you have with me Jesus son of the most high God 13 people were there right the demon recognized one why because one of them walked in authority the other ones were still learning and he stepped up and he said oh the other kingdom is here. What are we going to do? And this is what I love about Jesus. He gives us a wonderful picture <laughs> of what it is to release the authority of God through a life of obedience and surrender. He steps onto the scene. The demoniac comes, kind of challenges him, kind of begs him, says, don't send me into the pit. Don't send me out of the region because I rule over this region and I've established authority in this area. And he knows the principle, but he's still begging for mercy because he knows the nature of God. So give me mercy, give me mercy, give me mercy. And so Jesus looks at him and says, what's your name? And he says, we are legion, for we are many. A legion is about 2,000 soldiers in a Roman cohort. So you probably have about 2,000 or so demons that are occupying this person. And with one word, all two, get out. Get out. The unclean spirits leave the man, enter into the unclean animal, the pigs, and they're driven off the side of a cliff as a symbol of the authority of that region being changed over. This is what I love, and this is the principle of the kingdom. Jesus turns to the very man, the very man that ruled for Satan, and, say, and he comes to him and goes, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, no. Talk about your all-time letdowns. Follow me. No. That don't make no sense. It kind of hurts a little. Yeah, but you don't have to understand the plan of God turns to the man that ruled with demonic authority and says to him, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to go back into the Decapolis and you're going to spread my kingdom. Because what once was inside of you is now gone. And now there is a new authority that lives inside of you because you believe in. Now wherever your feet go, where you used to rule with intimidation and fear, you are now going to rule with love and mercy. And when they see you and you testify about me, they're going to look and they're going to say, isn't this the guy that used to do all these things? What a miraculous thing has taken place. And my kingdom will be established through the very vessel that was meant to be used for evil. Come on. That's the power of obedience and surrender, living a life of worship to God. It can change cities. We, we think in terms of people. We need to start thinking in terms of cities. 
God save Lubbock. Save this city in Jesus' name. Everybody that does not know the name of Jesus in this city, who has turned their back on the name of Jesus, who has chosen to bend their knee to lesser lovers, call them back into your fold, Lord. Call them to a knowledge of you. And let your authority be established even greater in this region. In the dark places that are not in the light, let them be exposed to light and change in Jesus' name. We are meant to release authority into the earth. And we do that by living a lifestyle of worship. We also do that through actually engaging in worship. See, it's not just a lifestyle. It's both an event and a lifestyle. It's not one or the other. It's both. Because if you live a lifestyle of worship, the outflow of your being will have an event of worship. You will engage God. People, ah, how honest should I be? Very honest. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. If we go the whole week waiting for Sunday and we don't really engage with God, we're missing the point. If we go days upon days and not engage with the Lord, I'm not here to condemn you, I'm here to encourage you. If we go days upon days upon days without engaging with Jesus, we're missing the point of what we have been called to. You are a world changer and a history maker. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Our potential is through the roof. But somewhere along the way, we've bought into we're not good enough. We've bought into that can't be me. I'm sure the demoniac that was delivered thought the same thing. And yet Jesus commissioned him and sent him out. You carry the very presence of God. The Holy of Holies is in you to release into the world. What are we waiting for? Let's do this thing. Let's change our city with the, with the message of Jesus. Let's change our world. I'm going to skip over 80% of what I planned on saying. And I'm going to tell you one story. I'm going to tell you one story. Is that good? Yeah, that's good. And then I'm going to preach to you the rest of the next one. Here's the story. I want to give you an example of worship as an event, releasing the authority of the Lord into the world. And then I'm going to give you next week an, an example of worship as a lifestyle, releasing the authority of God into the world. I think I did already with Matthew 5, but I'll give you another. It'll be free. Paul and Silas. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas. i uh, give you a little bit of backdrop about the story. There's a, uh, a girl that is demon-possessed that opens, operates as a fortune teller for guys that are using her to make money. And that demon recognized the authority on Paul's life and followed him around for days, teasing him. Oh, these are the ones that are from the kingdom of God. They follow Jesus. Oh. Having fun at their expense to the point that Paul couldn't take it anymore. And he turned around and he said, fine, just get out of her. And she got set free. <laughs> he may not have done it with the right motives, but he got set free. <laughs> so the demon leaves her. The, the people that had her in their employment recognize she can't read people anymore. And so they go and they find Paul and Silas and they bring them to the jailers, to the authorities, the Romans, and they say, these dudes messed up our business. Yeah, she set free of a demon, but yeah, okay. A little selfish on their part. They didn't know Jesus. These people, they messed up our business. We no longer have a way of income. She was the means. And plus, they're also teaching about a religion that is not officially sanctioned under Roman law, and they're breaking the law by doing so. So what happens? Paul and Silas get, listen, they didn't just get, people always like, they got thrown in the prison. No, 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 no. It was more than that. Basically, you had a mob form that ripped off their robes and then beat them severely with rods. They weren't just, they weren't just, oh, it's time to go to prison now. 
They were beaten severely with many blows, is what the scripture says. Over and over. Their clothes. Can you imagine the emotional turmoil that you would be sent into if somebody came up to you, started to tear off your clothes, and then beat you over and over and over again, and then throw you into a prison cell, and you don't know what's going on or if you're going to get out? What position would your emotional state be in? It'd be pretty rough, wouldn't it? This is what just happened to Paul and Silas. How do they respond? I love this. Because they lived with a different mentality. They lived with a different outlook. Acts 16, verse 25 through 30. says, But about midnight, now we've already got the backdrop, so that's good enough. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Let's have like a transparent, honest moment. If that had happened to us, how many of you wish you had a cell phone? Even if you were 85, Mom, can you help me? I just need a word of encouragement right now. You guys ever been there? What are these guys doing? They're praying and they're worshiping, singing hymns of praise to God. And notice this, see, Every time you go to prison, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It sounds weird. But it says the prisoners were listening to them. Paul was in chains, not for his sake, but for the sake of the gospel. And so here we have it. <laughs> prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake. Well, that's interesting. What's happening? Don't waste your trials, people. In the midst of their heartache, in the midst of their difficulty, in the midst of their suffering, they chose to worship God. They followed their lifestyle, led into an event, and at the releasing of their worship, authority came forth. An earthquake happens. And look at what happens with this great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and every chain was unfastened. Well, that's not normal. That, to quote the great philosopher, that ain't natural. It's not normal. Chains are unfastened. When the jailer, now you have to understand, the jailer was given specific instructions, hold them tight fast hold them do not let them go when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open what does he do he draws his sword and was about to kill himself because he knew hey the doors are open the chains are off these guys are free nothing's going to keep them here they're going to go run and be free i might as well beat the romans to it and kill myself because they're going to kill me it'll probably be worse than me just taking care of business by myself that's how hopeless his situation was but here's the thing when Paul and Silas get set free, they're looking for a different kind of freedom to be released. And so here we have it. When the jailer woke, saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself! Slow your roll! We're here! Don't do it! And he called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They were imprisoned by the authority of Rome. But when they worshipped the one for whom they were whipped, the authority of another kingdom showed up. The authority of God's kingdom supplanted the authority of Rome's, and freedom came to the captives because two men decided to worship in the midst of their trial. You realize that your worship in the midst of the trial oftentimes is not for you. It's for others. See, everybody thought, everybody thought, oh, they're set free, they're going to run. You know, you see, when the chains fell off of Paul and Silas, they knew it is for freedom that we are set free, but we're about to bring freedom to a whole different level in the life of this jailer and in his family. And that jailer runs up, bows his knees, oh, what must I do to be saved? 
That's why we're here. They endured whipping, scourging, and mistreatment with a great attitude. And through the midst of all of their punishment, because I have not done that well, I don't know about you, but I have not always done that well. Can I get an amen? I haven't always done it well, but they did because they saw a greater picture than what was being painted. See, they were set free from the prison, but they were looking to set free the prisoners. A whole different prison that was in operation. Paul and Silas, their worship literally broke out of the box. It set all of the prisoners free physically, but not for them to walk free from prison, but to set those who were in prison free. Look at the result when they worshiped, when they chose to worship in the midst of adversity. Acts 16, 31, 34. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. This is the answer to what must I do to be saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in the house. He got to preach to his whole family as a result of him staying in the prison that God opened an opportunity for him to leave. That's another message. And he took them that very hour out uh, of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Worship in adversity turned an enemy into a friend. Worship in adversity took a tormentor and turned him into a healer. Who knows? This is postulation. I don't know. But the guards were whipping him and he was there to be instructed. Who's to say he wasn't a part of that process? Beating them down with blows and rods and whipping him and all of a sudden the very ones that were whipping him turn around and say, let me heal your wounds. That's the power of releasing authority through worship. That's the power of releasing authority through worship. What must I do to be saved? Oh, this is awesome. Tormentor and your healer, it established the authority of God in the household of the one who deals with a captive audience of prisoners on a daily basis. You don't think that that jailer is going to go back to work and be like, well, let me tell you about Jesus. Everybody that gets arrested and comes in who really needs Jesus now has one who has witnessed something incredible through the releasing of worship, and now the testimony goes forward to people after people after people after people. God has a plan for some of your hardships, people. That doesn't preach well, and I know that. Because, because we want to, we want to talk about how uh, we're, we're, we're supposed to get out of hardship and stuff. Tell that to the disciples. Tell that to Peter when he's crucified upside down. Tell that to John when he's boiled in oil twice and exiled to the island of Patmos. And when he was exiled to the island of Patmos, what did he get? The revelation of Jesus. Don't waste your trials. You have a choice to be bitter or better. Choose to be better. Let bitterness go. God's looking for people that will engage in the power and the purpose of worship and release his authorities in the world. Are you that people? <clears throat> Are you that people? <laughs> Bow your heads with me.